Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Amanda Jadro, the Director of Portfolio Management at Tricom. As an administrative and financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Tom Erb with Talent Resources. For over 20 years, Tom has specialized in talent solutions for companies in a variety of industries, sizes, and types. As an, ex as an executive for two of the largest staffing and recruiting companies in the country, he has worked with some of the most recognizable and well-respected companies in the United States. In 2010, Tom formed Talent Resources, a consulting firm that helps organizations maximize their talent ROI through better recruitment, selection, onboarding, and retention processes. As a recruiting expert, Tom has presented at the American Staffing Association, National Association of Personnel Services, and TechServe Alliance National Conferences. Tom is president of Ohio Search and Staff Association and past president of Human Resources Association of Central Ohio. Talon Resources is a consulting, training, and coaching company focusing on the staffing and recruiting industry with the expertise and proven track record of success needed to help their clients grow their businesses. Effective prospecting is the foundation for the entire sales process. Without the right prospects, you can't be successful. In today's edition of the Industry Insider Webinar, Tom will teach you a repeatable process for identifying, targeting, and managing staffing and recruiting prospects. Takeaways include identify, target, and manage prospects, create a compelling phone message. By the end of this session, you'll know the techniques for effective prospecting and how to create a compelling phone message to separate yourself from the competition and secure the appointment. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature or um, the chat feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Tom. Okay, thanks, Amanda. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with us today. Uh, we're going to talk about something that I think is the foundation for all sales, which is prospecting. Uh, if we don't get the prospecting part right, then it doesn't matter how good we are with the rest of the process. So uh, effective prospecting is really a critical component. And uh, as Amanda alluded to, I, we do consulting with a lot of different staffing companies, and I work with uh, salespeople in the staffing industry all the time. I was a salesperson for years. I was a sales manager. I, I've managed lots of salespeople over the years. And I can tell you that this is an area that trips a lot of people up. They just don't do the right things uh, to identify the right prospects. And then also when we're actually going out and trying to engage these prospects, uh, it's becoming more and more challenging. So we'll talk about some of those things, about some of the challenges that we face in the prospecting process, uh, why some of the things that we've done in the past that were very successful don't seem to work anymore, and how we can create a process that does work much better. So let me uh, go ahead and start off here. Um, there was a study that was done a couple years ago by uh, a, a sales company, and they looked at over a million sales calls. They, they analyzed a million different sales calls, and they uh, ran a lot of different data, but one of the things that they found was that the ratio of voicemails to live connects was 22 to 1. So let's think about that for a second. If we make 44 calls in a day, we talk on average to two people. Uh, if we're trying to get four or five, six appointments a week, uh, we have to hit some pretty big numbers to be able to do that. And the problem is, is that that ratio continues to increase uh, as time goes on. So if I think back to my days in the staffing industry when I was doing dedicated sales, and I was making a lot of cold calls on the phone, I actually tracked my own numbers because I wanted to see how effective I was and I wanted to see if I was able to improve these numbers. 
at that point, I was at a six to one ratio, and I was frustrated with that. So I would I'd make forty, fifty calls, talk to seven, eight people during the course of a day. Well, now I make those same calls, and I'm talking to two people, maybe one, maybe three, some days. Uh, it's not that we're doing anything different than I was doing 15, 16 years ago. What it is is that we're seeing all sorts of things that are causing this. And the primary thing, I believe, I am strongly believe, is the advent and the, just the uh, normalcy of caller ID. Everybody has caller ID. In 2001, not everybody did. And so there were more people that were picking up their phone not knowing who it was. But now people are not only able to screen their calls more effectively, but they're doing it a lot more because they're also getting bombarded by all different forms of communication. So things such as email and texting and social media and all sorts of different types of communication now, we're all getting bombarded. And if you think about 15, 16 years ago, we didn't have that same uh, we didn't have those same issues. I'm still busy getting lots of calls, probably getting more mail at that time, but we weren't getting bombarded. We weren't getting hit from all different types of, of avenues. Email was fairly uh, early uh, still at that point, and also uh, we didn't have anything that was called social media back then. So the problem is, is that we continue to go in this direction. So we're not going to stop at 22 to 1. There are companies like Coca-Cola that a couple years ago pulled their corporate office members and employees and said, we're thinking about getting rid of voicemail on our phones. What do you think? 97% of employees said, yes, get rid of voicemail. You've got millennials and others that just aren't even checking their voicemail anymore. It's just not a preferred form of communication. And then also you've got people who continue to screen more and more uh, their calls coming in. So what do we do? Well, we really have three options. But oh, before I get to that, let me play a game here. So humor me for a second. Let's play where does your cold call rank on your prospect's priority list because this really ties into why they're not answering the phone. So if we think about all the different people during the day that call our prospects up, and we're just one of those people, where do we rank on that list? Well, let's get a little bit of uh, – uh, let's have a little fun with this here. So the first thing is a company owner, a president, or a senior executive calls you up, you're probably going to answer the phone. If your boss's boss calls you, that probably doesn't happen too often. You figure something's up and you need to answer the phone. And then your boss, then their kids, then their spouse or significant other, a client, a personal friend, a coworker. See, we're still not on the list. Uh, we're still going down this list, and we're nowhere near it. A business friend or an advisor, a vendor that they like, and it, and or is critical to their business. A referral from any of the previous people we just talked to, they're more likely to pick up the phone. A vendor they're even indifferent about, they'll pick up the phone before they talk to us. A sales rep they've talked to before. A vendor they don't even like, they'll talk to before us. And then finally, if they still are open to picking up the phone, they'll take our cold call. So if we've never called them before, they're looking over and they're going, why would I want to answer that? And that's why that ratio has gotten to the number that it is. And that's why I talk to so many salespeople that say, I just can't get anybody on live on the phone anymore. And there's a very, there's very uh, significant and obvious reasons for that. The good news is that there are people that are actually lower on the list than us. There's the ex-husband or wife, and then there's the IRS. So um, just thought I'd have a little bit of fun with that. But you see what the point is that I'm trying to make. We tend to think of as salespeople that we're calling in a vacuum. You know, it's important to us. We're sitting there and we're going, okay, I'm going to make this phone call, and we've mapped it out. We've found this person's phone number. We've researched them. We've gone through all this process, and then we pick up the phone and call them, and we get a voicemail. And then we get frustrated because they don't pick it up. But we have to realize on the other side, when they're looking over and making a decision whether or not to pick up the phone, we're pretty insignificant in comparison to all the other things that they have going on. So this is a real issue for us because – most salespeople have been brought up that the phone is the central tool for us to be able to do our sales activity. So what do we do about it? Well, we've got three options. <clears throat> One, we can make more calls. But we've already seen that that's unsustainable and it's becoming less and less efficient as the days go on. So let's scratch that out. Two, we can get the prospect to call us back. I have a lot of salespeople that say to me, why doesn't the prospect call us back? And my answer is, 
I have clients that pay me money that still don't call me back. People are busy, and people run out of time. And so they make decisions on how they're going to spend their time. And so for us to think that we're going to get people to call us back, prospects to call us back, is not really a good long-term strategy, and it just tends to lead to frustration. So, yes, that's absolutely, we would love to have prospects call us back, and when it happens, it's great, but we just need to treat that as a bonus. What we really need to be focusing on is to get the prospect to answer the phone when we call, to get them to look over at caller ID and say, yes, I'm going to take a little bit of my time to talk to this person. So how do we do that? Well, first I want to introduce a concept here that I want everybody to think about. And it's the concept or the mindset of sales is a game of chess, not war. Now, if you think about the game of chess, it is a game of strategy. It's a game of making moves that can either hurt you or help you in comparison to the other person moving. And you can't win a game of chess in one move, but you certainly can set yourself up to have a better chance of winning it or to losing it in a move. And all of those moves build on itself, on each other. Contrastingly, war is a game, is a game of cards where we have, both have a single card, we slap it down, and the person that has the higher hand wins. It's very transactional. It happens over and over again, and it is the way that most salespeople approach sales. How do I know this? It's because when I talk to salespeople and I ask them, when you're making a cold call, what is your primary goal? And almost inevitably, their primary goal is to get an appointment. And that right there is, is a pass or fail, win or lose, transactional approach to selling. If I am trying to get an appointment or I'm trying to get an order, and that is my primary objection objective, then that is basically a win or lose proposition for me. In most cases, it's going to be lose because we've already seen that 22 out of 23 times we don't even get a live person. And then we have very, very few opportunities to actually try and get an appointment. So instead, what we want to do is we want to realize that every step in the sales process that we do builds on itself and that we can do certain things, certain activities that allow us to have a greater chance of success down the road. So rather than going and approaching cold calling when we call people as if it's a one-time shot, I've got to get on there, I've got to get my best impression, I've got to convince them to meet with me in person, Instead, if we look at it as just part of a process where we're trying to do a few things like build a little bit of credibility and build a little bit of rapport and let them know that we exist and have a more natural conversation with them, we have a much, much better chance of success and it's going to position us for future conversations. So this brings us to the overall sales process that, that we utilize and that, that we um, recommend in the staffing industry. And if you take a look at the top, uh, very top uh, circle there, the first thing we want to do is we want to identify what we call suspect companies and contacts. And I'll define suspects in, in a second here. Then what we do is we implement a repeatable sales contact schedule. It's 10 weeks long and it has very specific messaging and we'll talk about all of that stuff here. Um, as we go through that, then we're going to qualify prospects and targets we're going to add opportunities to our pipeline. We're going to then work those opportunities through our pipeline stages, and then ultimately we're going to close those out as wins or losses. And all the while, we are replenishing that sales process with new suspects and prospects. So for this particular session, what we're going to really talk about is the prospecting piece of this and how do we effectively prospect. And so that is going to be really your first, uh, first three pieces of this six-step process. So um, we talked about prospects, and um, or we, excuse me, we talked about suspects. We call this focused prospecting, where we actually uh, are having a targeted approach to how we go about prospecting, rather than just calling companies and and just going out there and kind of doing the shotgun approach. What we want to do instead is we want to identify what we call suspects. And suspects are companies and contacts that have the look and feel 
have all the characteristics of a client, but we have not qualified them yet. So let's say that I'm doing industrial staffing. Uh, then a suspect is probably going to be something like a manufacturing facility or a warehouse. It's a company that uh, has a large building, has a certain square footage. It's a company that is in an industry that typically uses contract staffing, maybe has seasonality to it. When we drive past that location, we see lots of cars out in the parking lot, or we see lots of empty spots in the parking lot, which could be an indication that they have seasonality and that they need those spaces uh, during certain times of the year. So those are all the things that we would think about as far as a suspect. We suspect, based on criteria, that they, are, uh, they could be a prospect for us. Then what we do is we go through and we qualify those, and then they become prospects. Once we've actually identified that, yes, they do utilize contract staffing, or they should be use, utilizing contract staffing uh, based on the criteria, then they would become a prospect. So maybe that is you've had a conversation in the past with somebody at that facility, and they have indicated that, yes, they do utilize staffing, or an employee of yours has told you, maybe through their application or through an interview, that they're utilizing staffing, maybe they work there. Whatever it is, we know that they utilize contract staffing. We are not in discussions with them for them to use us, but we do know that they use. And then the third category of prospects is what we call targets. And targets are the ones that we not only know that they utilize staffing, but we are in discussions with them about possibly working with us. So essentially the door has opened it could be very early in the process, or it could be very far along in the process. It could be in negotiating close, where we're just going over details of the contract. But we not only know that they use staffing, but we're in conversations about possibly doing business with them. And then you'll see on the left-hand side the goals. What we recommend is that at any given time, a nice, healthy list of prospects is about 300 suspects, 100 prospects, and about 30 targets. And this is going to vary a little bit based on the market that you're in. Maybe it's a cold market. Maybe you're a new sales rep, and, or maybe it's a new market for your company, and you really haven't been able to get much information there. Or maybe it's a market where you've been in for 20 years, and you pretty much know everybody that utilizes with some exceptions. So in that case, you would probably have less suspects and more prospects. What you want to do, the whole point of having of narrowing it down to just 300 is that it doesn't spread you too thin. And when I talk to sales reps that are struggling, it inevitably comes down to a couple things. The first one is activity. But from a prospecting standpoint, it comes down to they either have spread themselves too thin and they're going after too many prospects, or they're too narrow and not going after enough. And so we want to have a nice balance there. And what I've found over the years about being in staffing sales is that about 300 suspects is about right. And then you're going to, always going to have – you're never going to have exactly 300, 130, but that's a nice balanced prospecting list that you want to go after. So where do we identify suspects? Well, um, there are lots of different places to do it. You can do it through having uh, assignment history forms that your temporary employees fill out and give to you. Uh, you can do it through book a list. You can do it through all sorts of different places. But there are two places where I believe that you can do the vast majority of your prospecting, and that is LinkedIn and Indeed. And on LinkedIn, now LinkedIn has changed a lot of things in the last couple of weeks. We could have a whole session just on LinkedIn. Uh, but uh, you still are able to do some advanced searches on there, especially if you have a sales navigator or higher level of uh, premium product, then you can still run advanced searches. You want to do searches on who are the most likely contacts. So what level are they in the organization? Uh, if you have some of the advanced search features, you can still do what size companies, uh, what types of industries. Uh, What's the geographic area? You can do radius searches or city searches. Do all those things. Once you get the, the list that you want, you save that search, and then you can set up to get daily or weekly alerts on that. So it is once you've done it one time, it's constantly feeding you new leads and new suspects. The other place is Indeed. 
So in addition to looking at LinkedIn and seeing who the people are, we can also see what companies are most actively out there recruiting for positions that we can help them with. And one of the things I like to say is we're about the only industry that I can think of where our prospects actually advertise that they need our help. And so we need to take advantage of that. We need to go on to Indeed, do the same exact thing. You run position geography searches. Once you get what you like, you save the search and you get daily email alerts. Now what I recommend is don't reach out to somebody the day or two or three days after they've posted a job because they are at their highest level of hope at that point. They've also probably spent some money on Indeed or Career Builder or somewhere else. And so they are, right now they don't want to talk to recruiters. They don't want to talk to us. That they are waiting for the flood of qualified applicants to come in, like ZipRecruiter talks about. What we want to do instead is we want to wait a week to 10 days. Give them a chance to get frustrated by it. Give them a chance for, for the process not to work out as well as they want to, and then be able to go to them and say, hey, how's that search going? Uh, I saw you were doing a search there. Did you have success with it? Uh, is there a possibility we might be able to help you out if not? And that way they may be more receptive to it if indeed they haven't had that kind of a success. I also get asked a lot, okay, now I'm going through this process. Where do I find all this, these contacts, their information? Well, there are a bunch of different ways that we can find this. And this is one of the things that we're always looking at with my company is what are the best ways that we can find contact information, uh, both on a sales and a recruiting side as far as candidate side. LinkedIn is the place that we start with, and uh, what I typically will do is we'll go onto the LinkedIn profile of the person we're looking for and see if more and more you're seeing people are actually putting contact information in their profiles. So what we want to do first is see if they've put it in that, uh, in their profile. If they haven't, then what we can also do is we can go to other people in that company that are more likely to put their information on their profile. And those are people like sales reps and recruiters and public relations, media relations, investor relations. Those people will tend to publish their, uh, their email and their phone number, numbers more readily than maybe an HR person does. If we also look over here at contact out on the right-hand side, uh, this is a relatively new system, but it's, it seems to be gaining a lot of attention. It is a Google Chrome plugin that if you go to contactout.com, you can sign up for it. They give you 100 free credits. And what you can do is it is a Google Chrome plugin that when you go to a LinkedIn profile, Contact Out will pop up and it will go out to the internet and will try and find contact information for that particular person. Now, Sometimes it finds it, sometimes it doesn't. The other great thing about it is that if that person has put their contact information anywhere in their public profile, it'll go ahead and show it to you and it doesn't burn up a credit. So rather than have to dig through that person's profile every single time to see if they've put it somewhere, Contact Out will actually do that work for you and will have it listed there if they have it. And it's amazing how many times somebody does put their uh, does put their information into their profile, but maybe it gets a little bit buried. In the middle, we have Hunter. And if you go to hunter.io, it used to be called Email Hunter. This website you can go to, and you can put in the website of a company, and it will then come back with the naming convention of their email. So if they're, let's say their naming convention is first letter, last name, at company.com, it will actually show us that. We also can sign up for a free account with them. You get 150 credits a month where you can look for specific email addresses through Hunter. So you put somebody's name in there, they'll go out and try and find it for you, and you get 150 once free. You can do premium accounts that cost more, but for most of us, 150 a month is pretty good. Connectifier is, uh, was recently bought by LinkedIn last year. It's similar to Contact Out. Uh, right now, LinkedIn is really pushing this product hard and is, is providing some pretty good discounts on it. They're also providing free trials. So uh, that's something that you can go and do. And again, it will go out and try and find that contact information for you. And then lastly, we have data.com connect. Data.com is a salesforce.com company, but you don't have to be a Salesforce user to use data.com connect. What, what this does is this is more like a 
a Hoover's or a Sales Genie or an Info USA, but the difference is is that this is all community populated information. So you've got a bunch of sales reps that belong to data.com connect that are constantly uploading their contacts because you get free credits that you can turn around and buy other contact information with, and they're constantly updating this information. So in some respects, the, the information, the data in there is even more up to date than on some of the paid sites like Hoover's and Info USA, where they're actually going out and researching uh, companies on a regular basis. So those are just some different ways to find contact information. I know that's always a tough piece to this. So how do I get the prospect to answer the phone? Well, we do it by creating what we call a compelling value proposition. And this is absolutely critical to this. We have had, uh, when I show you the sales process that we use from a prospecting standpoint, we have had hundreds of sales reps go through this process. Without a doubt, the ones that have the most success have two things. One, they diligently follow the sales process. And two, they, are, uh, they have a compelling value proposition that resonates with prospects. Their value proposition, what makes them different, catches the attention of the prospect. Because if you sound the same as everybody else, then it's just going to sound like a lot of noise because these prospects are getting bombarded by other very similar messages. So we have to have a value proposition that resonates with them. What is a value proposition? Well, it's the unique value that a business offers to its customers. And there are two critical components to this. The first is the word unique, and the second is the word value. If you don't have, have something that is unique about your business, then you don't have a value proposition. But if you don't have something that has value, you also don't have a, 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 a value proposition. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So one of the things when I ask companies, when I ask staffing firms, what makes you unique? What makes you different than other staffing companies? I get a couple of the same things almost all the time. People talk about their screening process. They talk about background checks. They talk about drug screens. They talk about uh, testing on skills. Almost every staffing company I talk to does that. They do it to different, differing levels, and they have different types of tests and different background checks and things like that, but every one of them has it. It's rare that I run across a company that doesn't. So in that particular case, it's not unique. It has value, but it's really at this point a standard in our industry. On the other hand, you can have something that's unique, but it doesn't provide value. Years ago, when I was doing sales, I was working for a large national staffing company, and we had one of the early can, uh, client portals. And one of the things that we had on the client portal was the ability for our clients to go online and run their own reports. And so I thought this was the greatest thing in the world. There was almost no other company that had this. I went out and sold it to every client and prospect that I possibly had. Uh, sat down, and over and over and over again, they would shake their head. They were very polite listening to me. They would, you know, they perk up their eyebrows every once in a while, and at the end I would say, what do you think? And almost every time they would go, that's great, but I want you to run the reports. I don't want to have to run the reports. And so we had something that was unique, but it really provided no value to them. And here I went out there and spent months with that as being my leading differentiator until I finally realized that it really just didn't have value. It was unique enough, but it didn't have value. So how do we figure out what our value proposition is? Well, we need to ask ourselves some questions. We need to ask, who am I competing with, and what are their strengths and weaknesses? We need to really get to know what our competition does well and what they don't do well. We tend to focus on what they don't do well. We're always probing for uh, our candidates and sometimes our clients on what is it that you didn't like about them. We may not say it that way. We may be more tactful than that, but that's really what we're always trying to get at. We tend to shy away from trying to figure out what they do really well. But we need to know that so that if we're competing against them and we're trying to come up with things that are different, that we're able to actually do that. And I can tell you from my own experience, I was in staffing for over 16 years before I started my consulting business. After I got out of staffing as far as, as running a staffing operation and started to do consulting to the staffing industry, I started actually working with some of my competitors. And uh, first of all, I found out they were much nicer people than I thought they were. 
And second of all, I realized I knew nothing about them. I knew nothing about their strengths or weaknesses. Some of the, some of the preconceived notions that I had about them were completely wrong. Some of the ways that I had been selling against them were completely wrong. And now I found out, wow, you guys actually offer some of the same stuff we did. Uh, and it was a real revelation to me and probably a unique revelation that not a lot of people get to see unless you leave a company and end up going to a competitor at some point. Um, so we really need to get to know what, our, what their strengths and weaknesses are so that we can sell against those and be prepared to sell against them. What is it that makes us different and what is it that makes us better? And it's not just different, but it's better. And how do we quantify it? What's the proof? We need to make sure that we have some sort of proof. What gives us credibility? Things that give us proof are things like testimonials, case studies, data that we have, comparisons to others in the industry. How do we stack up to the industry? How do we stack up to competition? Uh, those are the types of things. Awards, certifications, all of those different things are the types of things that reinforce our value proposition. Because just going out with a strong value proposition and not having anything to back it up, uh, in many cases, does not provide the, the full strength that we need for that value prop. Being able to back it up, saying that we do something very well, and then backing up with a list of testimonials from our clients that reinforce that, that's a much more powerful message. We need to know what's important to the client. And then how do we clearly state this in a short period of time? Maybe 10 to 15 seconds is, is a little tongue-in-cheek. We don't need to say our entire value proposition in 10 to 15 seconds, and most likely we can't, but we need to be able to grab their attention in the first 10 to 15 seconds because that is at the most what people are going to give us before they delete our voicemail message, before they tone us out if we catch them live on the phone, before they delete our email, before they throw our letter away. We need to make sure that we catch their attention immediately. So now that we've done that, let's actually go and do some prospecting, okay? Now, the tips I'm going to talk to you about, they're all dependent on one thing, which is that your caller ID actually shows the name of your staffing company. If it doesn't, then you need to, to do some things here that allows the prospect to know that it's you. So if let's say you're calling a lot from your cell phone. It may not say your staffing company name, but what you can do is you can say to them, hey, listen, I'm going to be calling you from this number. I'm going to give you a heads up. This is the number, so if you look for it, this area code. Or say, it shows up as my name, or it shows up as whatever it shows up as. But you've got to give them a heads up because you can go through all of this prep work that we're going to talk about and get them to the point where they would be interested in talking to you, and then they're going to look over, and they're not going to recognize the phone number, and they're not going to pick it up. So you've wasted all that effort. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to send them a letter. Yes, that's right. We're going to actually send them snail mail. Uh, I know for some of you that is completely uh, a foreign concept. And to be quite honest, it's kind of a foreign concept to most of our industry. I have ran across a total out of over 200 staffing companies I've worked with in the last seven years. I've talked to a total of zero that consistently sent, it, sent out letters. Now, I have talked to staffing companies that send out the occasional postcard, uh, or we'll send out an occasional mailing that's more of a marketing piece, but to actually send out an envelope that has a letter in it, I have yet to run across a staffing sales rep that does it. And if you're on the phone and you're saying that, oh, well, I do it, then you are in the absolute minority and you're doing something that your competition is not doing. There's been a significant decline overall in U.S. postal volume the past 10 years, almost 25%. Um, your competition, like I said, has shifted away from direct mail. Direct mail also gives us an opportunity to create brand awareness and build credibility. <clears throat> uh, it gives us the opportunity to form, to put together exactly what we want to say and get it in front of them in a physical format so that they are opening it up, they're looking at it, and even if they look at it just fleetingly, we at least have had an impression with them that is different than the two to 300 emails that they get and they don't get a, give a thought to. One of the keys to this is we want to be creative. What we want to do, we want to do a couple of things. One is we want to, uh, we want to make sure that we have include a letter that talks about our differentiators, and then we also want to have some accompanying proof 
with it. So typically we're going to have two pieces in the mailing, a letter and then proof. And the proof typically is going to be with uh, a list of testimonials from our client. Maybe it's a case study. Maybe it is showing uh, a lot of – maybe we have a lot of tenure with our clients. We have clients that have been with us for a long time. We can have a list of those different clients and talk about, hey, this is proof that we do a pretty good job. Otherwise, these companies wouldn't stick around with us as long as they have. So that's what we want to put in the mailing. But then on the outside, we want to do a couple subtle things that really psychologically make a big difference. One is we want to hand address the envelope, not the letter. I actually had a sales rep that hand addressed all of the letters. Uh, we don't need to do that. But we want to hand address the envelope. The second thing we want to do is we want to go out and find the biggest, flashiest, most colorful, interesting, gaudy, obnoxious stamps that we can get. And we're going to put them on the envelope. And as insignificant and silly as that sounds, it's amazing how many times I have had and, and other sales reps I've talked to have had people comment on the stamps. So the bigger the better, as big as you can. I've also talked to sales reps that instead of uh, putting one stamp for the full amount, they'll go out and they'll get smaller value stamps so there's multiple stamps on there just to get the attention. The key is we don't want it to look like mass mail. Another little trick that I learned a long time ago that, that to this day still do and it still works is around the holidays, go and get holiday stamps. Go and get Christmas trees and, and all, all the different types of, of holiday stamps and then hold on to them until the summer and then send them all out in the summer. And I guarantee you will get people that, that will call you laughing uh, saying, do you realize what stamp you sent me? And so it's a way to get their attention. It's a way to separate things. Because think about how you process mail, even personally or, or at home or at work. We all tend to look, we get our pile of mail, and we don't look at it one piece at a time. We sift through it real quick and look for anything that looks like it was personally written. Or in some cases we look like, if anything, looks like a check. But we prioritize the different mailings that we have. And then the ones that look like they're mass mailed, we may not even open. We may just throw right in the trash. So a couple of things to do with sending them a letter, but it's a really important part of the process. Then we're going to prep them with an email. And, and we, um, we want to send them an email before we call them because we want to give them a heads up that we're going to be calling. And if our value proposition has resonated with them at all, they're going to be more likely to pick up the phone. And so it also gives us an opportunity to, again, follow up on the letter and to send them a very detailed, very um, specific message. Because when we call and we leave voicemails, we always run the risk. There's always one or two that we just botch, that we just we fall all over ourselves. We don't leave a good message. We get off there and we go, boy, I sound like an idiot. I won't hear back from them. <clears throat> Funny thing is a lot of times those are the ones that call us back. But in an email, we can say exactly what we want to say. And so we want to send out that email. We also want to make sure that our LinkedIn pro profile reflects the type of image that we want to because what we found is that when we start to go out and do this type of prospecting, that people start to check us out on LinkedIn. They go to two places to reinforce our credibility or to check into us. They go to our website and they go to our LinkedIn profile. And so if our LinkedIn profile looks like a mess or it's incomplete or it doesn't have the same messaging that our value prop does, then that's what, we're going to lose credibility there. So we want to be able to back up that credibility instead and have a really strong LinkedIn profile. And the way we do that is with a good picture. We do it with a good summary. We need to have a summary that talks about our value proposition and talks about our own personal expertise, if that's applicable, and then shows them uh, recommendations and groups we belong to and any other types of materials that we want to have on LinkedIn. All right. We also want to use content marketing when we're going out and prospecting. Uh, and how we use content marketing is because we're going to be hitting prospects multiple times, and I'll talk about this in a second, we can't just be constantly following up with a voicemail saying, hey, it's me again, hey, it's me again, hey, it's me again. We need to have different types of information. We need to provide them some value whenever possible. That way we're not as salesy. Uh, we don't come across as salesy because we're not always just hitting them with a sales pitch. And we come across as somebody that has additional value 
and we're trying to raise our level of credibility and expertise in their minds. So content marketing includes things like you know, emails, email marketing, blogs, white papers, webinars, seminars, those types of things that, that position us as a subject matter expert. So how many contacts does it make a, take to make a sale? Well, there have been a lot of studies that have been done over many years, and it used to be six times, and then it was eight times, and now most studies show that it takes between 10 to 12 times to make a sale, 10 to 12 attempts to make one sale. Um, Microsoft actually did their own internal study of their sales activity, and what they found was, and you see that this is their chart, is that it took 80% of their sales were made between the fifth and the twelfth contact, and yet most salespeople give up after the second or third phone call. And I can tell you from my experience, and, and if there are, are uh, owners and executives on the call, I'm sure there are, uh, you probably have some similar uh, examples of this. I get calls and emails from sales reps all the time because my title's president uh, and because I'm involved in different organizations, so I show up in different member directories, and so I get calls from a lot of different organizations. I rarely ever get a second phone call from anybody, ever. Uh, in fact, when I do, I actually will answer the phone because, and I will tell them, do you realize I don't get any second calls? Uh, and I will congratulate them on that because it is such a rare thing. And I almost never get sales reps that use a combination of different types of medium. They're almost always exclusively doing the phone or they're exclusively doing emails. I can't tell you how many sales reps send me email after email after email, which is probably automated uh, through their system, and at least I assume it is, and so I don't pay any attention to it. So because it takes this many times to make a sale, and yet most sales reps give up after one, two, or three attempts, we realized that we needed to create structure that requires salespeople to reach out to people the right number of times. And so that's where we came up with the sales process here that I'm showing you. And so this right here is, the, um, is our 10-week process for prospecting. And what we're doing is we're reaching out to suspects. We may be reaching out to some prospects as well. And we start off with our value prop mailing at the top there. So week one, we send out a letter. We talk about, hey, I know you get a lot of, of – um, I know you get a lot of people – that reach out to you, a lot of salespeople trying to contact you. Let me tell you real quick why we're different. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, we list our differentiators and then say, I'm going to reach out to you next week to see if we can talk further. The next week, we're going to touch them three times. We're going to start with a follow-up email that says, hey, I sent you a letter last week. Uh, I know you're busy, so in case you didn't have a chance to look at it, here's what we're, um, you know, here are a couple things that make us different. I'm going to reach out to you via phone tomorrow between the times of this and this, and I'm hoping that we can have a couple minutes to talk. The next day, we call them during that time period. In many cases, we're still going to go into voicemail, but what we've already seen is that that 20 to 1 ratio, in many cases, is cut in half or in a third. And we're, we're getting two to three times as many people answering the phone because we're prepping them ahead of time and we are catching some people's attention. But let's say we leave a voicemail. So then what we do is we leave a follow-up email. Or we, or we leave the voicemail, excuse me, we leave the voicemail and we say, hi, I just want to follow up from the letter and the email I sent you. Just want to talk to you a little bit about what makes us different, uh, get an understanding of, of what your needs might be, either now or in the future, and see if, we, uh, uh, if there might be some value in us talking further. I'm going to send you an email, see if I can get 10 to 15 minutes on the phone with you. Again, these are chess moves here. I'm not saying I'm not trying. At no point do I ask them for a full-blown in-person appointment. Uh, I am asking them for little bits of commitment, but I'm asking them for less commitment as we go through. Week three, what we do is we send them a follow-up voicemail. Hi, hi, it's me again. Wanted to follow up, see if I could get on your calendar for a 10, 15-minute phone call. Week four, we do a follow-up email where we have a client testimonial. Hey, I thought you might be interested in seeing what one of our clients recently said about us. That just reinforces what I've been telling you about why we're different. Next week, we do a follow-up voicemail. Then week six and seven, we do what we call in your area. 
So we're reaching out to them. We're saying, hey, I have an appointment set up uh, next week that's close to you, and I have some time. These are the times that I'm available. Don't tell them you're available the whole day, or then they'll say, well, I thought you had an appointment. But tell them you've got some times that are available. Let me know if these times work for you or not. Uh, the day before that you're going to go out there, call them and remind them that you're going to be out. And what we've seen is that we actually have prospects and prospects executive assistants reach back out to us and say, hey, uh, I know you're going to be in this market next week on Tuesday, and you said that, you're, uh, that you wanted to stop in and introduce yourself. He's not going to be available, or I'm not going to be available. Can you do another time? So we've actually had people do this because at this point they're kind of getting used to us and we've established some credibility and the way that we're approaching sales is different than all the other staffing companies out there. And so we have elevated in, in many people's eyes the type of professional that we are and the type of message that we're delivering. Week eight, we're going to do some sort of content email. Hey, here's a white paper that we wrote that I thought might be of interest. Uh, here's a blog that our president recently wrote. If you don't have your own internal content, that's fine. Go on to Google and do a, do a search for content that would be of interest to your prospects and just share an article with them. Hey, I ran across this article and I thought of you. Uh, here it is. We'd still love to get on the phone with you. Week nine, we do what we call persistence voicemail. We say, hey, I'm, I, uh, you can't accuse me of not being persistent. I feel I've gotten to know your voicemail pretty well now. I would love to talk to you live as well. Could we get 10, 15 minutes? On the phone, so we make it kind of lighthearted, and we kind of reference the fact that we've been reaching out to them pretty consistently for a long period of time. And then week ten, we do the backing off email. So we send them an email that says, "I'm persistent. I, I pride myself on being persistent without being a pest. And uh, I've been reaching out to you for about the past two months or so, and haven't had a chance to connect with you. So I'm assuming either uh, you don't have a need for staffing." or you are completely happy with who you're with, or I just haven't done a good enough job of showing you why you should spend a little bit of time with me. Regardless of the reason, I'm going to back off. I'll reach out to you next quarter. Uh, if anything comes up in between then, feel free to call me anytime or, or email me anytime. We actually get prospects at this point to reach out to us because we are now pulling away from them. Because to this point, we've become kind of a regular thing with them. And realistically, some of our prospects aren't going to pay attention to us at all. They get two, 300 emails. What we're sending them isn't relevant. The voicemails we're leaving aren't relevant to them, or it doesn't resonate with them. That's fine. We don't need to get every single one of these prospects as a client. In fact, we need to get a very small percentage of these prospects as a client. If you send out 40 of these a week, and that's what I recommend you do, you, you start a new 40 every week and you just go through a new 40 letters every week, you only need to land one a week, or one out of those 40. And if you did that, you would have 52 new clients. And let's say you take two weeks off for vacation, you have 50 new clients. That is four or five times what most sales reps need to actually hit their quotas, hit their commissions. So we don't need to have very many of them. We can't worry about the, what the people who aren't interested think about this. What we're doing is we're trying to get in front of people enough that will the, our message will resonate with them that we have the opportunity to do work with them. And in many cases, it's not that they're not interested. That's not why they haven't reached back out to us. It's because they, it just hasn't been a priority up to this point, and we've been consistently reaching out to them so they feel, well, uh, if I don't catch them this week, I'll catch them next week. When we send out that backing off email, all of a sudden they're going, oh, I guess I better do something now if they have any level of interest. And we've seen it over and over again. So that's the prospecting process that, we, that we've developed that's worked very, very well in the staffing industry. Um, how does this tie into pipelines? So for any of you that actually utilize a pipeline as part of your sales process, the way that it works is that we have these suspects, prospects, and targets. As we go through and we're qualifying or disqualifying people through this process, uh, we're either going to qualify them, disqualify them completely so maybe they say to us, hey, I'm not the right person for you to talk to. Or, hey, we're a company of four. I don't know why we're on your list. Then we disqualify them. 
Otherwise, we're going to keep them as prospects. If we, if we go through the whole 10-week process and we uh, don't get any communication from them, we can't qualify or disqualify them. We keep them in as a suspect. If we talk to them, and in most cases we talk to them, we talk to 80, 90, sometimes 100% of the people we put through this process, we then can say, okay, are they a prospect? Did we qualify them? Uh, or are they a target because we actually had a conversation where it opened up the door to do business with them? And if it opens up the door to do business with them, then they become a target. Any target company or contact will then have an opportunity in our pipeline and will go through our sales process. So that's how all of this ties into the pipeline. And we're not going to go into that today because this is about prospecting. But I just wanted to tell you that's kind of how it ties into it. So I've gone through a lot of information. Uh, I'm sure that there are some questions. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. And we're going to, uh, so we'll open up um, uh, it for questions to everybody. And uh, Amanda, I'm, oh, oh, before I do that real quick, I just want to show you some of the results that we've gotten back. These are actual quotes from our sales reps. So this one was from a sales rep that had zero opportunities when we started the process. They had 25 opportunities and had closed six deals at the end of the, of we did 300 of them. Uh, staggered 40 a week over a period of multiple weeks and then 20 at the end in case you're questioning my math. But what she said is a giant woohoo in the last week I've signed contracts with both company A and company B. Both success stories from the sales process beginning with the mailer. There are a lot more success stories that have happened and are in process but I thought these were all worth mentioning. Uh, another one. This is a response I got from my week 10 backing off email that I sent yesterday. I've never talked to Susie and she's never responded to my emails until now. Just a reminder to stick with the plan and do what you say you're going to do because sometimes it works. You may say, well, Tom, that's not an overwhelming endorsement. But this actually came from somebody who was not a salesperson, who was not particularly enthused about doing the program, and who uh, at many cases kept saying, it's not working, it's not working. And uh, he was able to actually land this company as a client. He did the week 10 backing off. She responded back, apologized for not talking to him earlier and ended up getting orders out of them. We have a, all sorts of other ones too. We get where uh, sales reps have said, I've landed my biggest client ever using your process. It's so much easier to make calls because they feel like I have a reason. I love it because they know exactly what to do next. I'll never sell another way again. And we get these from people who are brand new to sales and brand new to the industry, all the way to industry veterans with 20, 30 years experience. Uh, we've, we've seen it. I had a sales rep that was new to the staffing industry, had been in sales for 12 years in another industry. He went through this in the first six weeks. He calls me up one day on my cell phone. We, we were not scheduled to have a call, and he just calls up and he says, uh, Tom, I just had to tell you, I love this process, and I wish I had it 12 years ago when I started the sales, when I started in sales. And he has had tremendous results uh, in just the first few weeks. This accelerated his learning curve and his, his productivity because he had a specific process. So that's it. Now I'll open it up for questions. We've got a few questions. So Amanda, any questions from the group? From the group? Hi, I don't have any questions that have come in yet. I think everyone's taking in all the information that you've provided. So if you do have any other questions, please go ahead and, and submit them now. It looks like a few are coming in here. Um, so what specific examples can you offer that others of your clients are using for the unique value that separates them from another? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, so things that I would look at are what do you specialize in? Um, you know, take a look, and if you say, well, Tom, I don't specialize in anything, we kind of do a little bit of everything, I still would guess that you prob there are probably areas that you're strong in. And you can take a look at past, um, you know, past placements. You can take a look at, uh, you talk to your, your recruiters about, hey, what are the positions you fill the most often? What are the positions we have the, the biggest database with? Which ones do you feel most comfortable with? And in some cases, you'll be able to, to tell pretty quickly. I would say the more specialized you can get, the more value you can show. So, uh, you know, and to me, the vertical that you're in is not 
necessarily a specialization. IT, healthcare, those are not specializations by themselves. They're a vertical that you're in, but there are so many, there are thousands of companies that do that. Um, so we need to get more specific. So it may be something like, well, I, I'm not only in IT, but we specialize in .NET developers. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm specifically in a particular industry, telecom or uh, energy or something like that. Uh, so that would be one thing I would do. The other thing is what level of expertise do you have? Uh, are you owned by a company or, or are you owned by uh, an owner or founder that has some sort of unique background? I've got one of my clients that the owner of the company uh, was a, a senior HR executive for years for Fortune 100 companies. And so that's part of his value proposition that they're able to go and sell to HR and say, hey, we know what you're going through because we were founded by an HR, a senior HR executive. Um, so th that's another thing. Or you know, somebody who um, was a um, was in the industry that you sell to. So you know, I've got one client that was a healthcare staffing company that is run by run and founded by a registered nurse that was that was practicing for many years before she started the staffing company. Take a look at things like certifications. Uh, take a look at any kind of, of data that you have that you can show that you're better than others. Take a look at um, you know uh, any um, awards that you've received. You know best of staffing, uh, best places to work, ISO 9000 certification. You know d different things like that uh, that you can um, that you can sell as selling points to the companies that you're working with. Okay, uh, I have another uh, question that's come in. Um, this particular staffing company is up against another staffing company who's been in the industry for 40 years and serves their clients well. Would you have any suggestions for this particular company? Yeah, I, again, I would, I would probably go back to some of the value prop that I talked about. Um, listen, there are going to be companies that are, are well entrenched. Um, yeah, every, every company, all companies have their strengths and weaknesses. And so I would, I would be talking to uh, employees that have worked there. I would be talking to your clients that utilize both of you uh, if you have some clients that are in common. We're always afraid to ask about it. And we, we, we want to ask, ask your clients why they like the other company. What is it they do really well? Because they're not going to tend to give you, they're not going to tend to air their dirty laundry with you or give you things that they don't feel they should. And sometimes your clients might get defensive. But if you ask them, you say, you know what, I know you work with both of us. You know, what is it you like about us? Uh, what is it that we do well? Well, let me ask you, what is it? I know you work with so-and-so too. What is it that they do well? We need to get a better sense of what it is that they really do well. But I would also talk to your candidates. And by the way, they may also share some of the things that they don't do well, but you didn't ask it. They may end up offering it up as you get to talking. Um, so you can get some insight into that. I think you just have to take a look and say, what is it that, that we do differently? Um, you know, being in a market for 40 years is, is usually a strength, um, but you could you could also take a look and say, well, you know what, we've uh, in some cases, you, when you have somebody that's in the market for 40 years, they may be set in their ways of doing certain things. They may not be as technologically advanced. They may not. There may be some other areas that you can say, hey, you know what, we really can differentiate ourselves in these ways. Tom, will we be able to provide um, copies of the PDF slides of today's presentation with um, individuals that were on today's yep. session? Okay. Absolutely. So, um, I, I, I want, yeah, I want everybody to have them. So, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Perfect. So those of you that have asked, I'll go ahead and send them out after the session today. And if um, you'd like me to, to include you, please just go ahead and either send me an email or a message here while we're in the session. I'll go ahead and put up the contact information um, at this time. I've also opened up a poll. If you could provide your feedback, that would be wonderful. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, please go ahead and submit them now as we're wrapping things up. Tom, do you have any uh, final thoughts um, for our uh, attendees today? 
Uh, I, I would just offer up that if anybody has any specific questions, um, you know, I, I always offer this up, and um, I usually get one or two people to take me up on it, but I, I would be happy to talk to anybody about specifics that, you know, the one person had a challenge about the 40-year uh, staffing company. Uh, you know, you all have unique situations that you're coming up against. I'd be happy to talk through it with you. Um, so you know, please feel free to reach out to me, and we'll get something scheduled on the phone. Um, but I, I just, uh, you know, I hope everybody got some value out of this and has an idea of, of you know, how to focus on prospecting moving forward, and, and best of luck to everybody. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate all the information you were able to provide today. Um, I, I'm sure that people are able to walk away from this session um, and put some things into place right away that, that they can benefit from. So I'd like to thank um, our presenters today for our pre our presenting the webinar today and for everyone um, taking the time to, to sit through the session on effective prospecting for staffing professionals. We will have a recording available on our website at tricom.com. It's under the Resources Industry Insider Webinars tab. Uh, thank you again for your participation and watch for information on next month's session. Have a fantastic day. Thanks so much.